Hello again, everybody. It's time once again for Coco and Daltz. I'm not Coco. And I'm not Daltz. And this is episode number 008. And in today's podcast, we are going to talk about hot topics. Hot topics! Not the really bad teen clothing store hot topic that you would find in your local mall if your local mall is still in business. Right, if you still have a local mall. This uh, episode today is jam-packed with exciting material. (laughs) Coco, let me go over the roster if if I may. Okay. We're going to start with our thoughts about Black Panther the movie. (laughs) We are going to move efficiently after that. To David Letterman and George Clooney and what we thought of that show. And what's bringing up the rear? And bringing up the rear (laughs) is Sarah Jessica Parker (laughs) and all the nastiness that is involved around her and her situation. So let's leave that for now. That'll be a little tease. We're going to end on the down note. We're going to end on it. Well, we might do some lounge singing at the end of the show if we... (laughs) <laughs> if, we, if I'm brave enough. I don't think we should just because I don't want to pay for the rights to <laughs> come on, feel the noise. <laughs> oh, don't spoil it for you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Should we redo this? <laughs> so, Black Panther. Okay. We went to see Black Panther on opening night because you're stoked about the superhero movies. Yes. Usually, I actually don't like to go see superhero movies on opening weekend um, because the theaters are too crowded and I usually have read the spoilers because I don't care about spoilers, so I know what happens. So it's not like The Last Jedi where I'm waiting for Luke to astrally project himself at the end. Like, it's not like that's a huge shock. So I know it's coming. Um, Spoiler alert for those of you who maybe not seen The Last Jedi. Whoops. (laughs) We're not editing that up. So yeah, so we, we managed to see it on opening night. And yeah. And what was your impression of Black Panther, the movie? Um, uh, my impression was I liked it. I didn't love it. Mm-hmm. It's not the favorite Marvel movie that I have seen, but I enjoyed it. Um, I thought the cast was terrific. Yeah. Everybody did a fantastic job. Michael B. Jordan was great as Killmonger. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o, she was okay. I think she's going to be given like a meteor role going forward in Black Panther sequels, so I'd like to see what she does with that. Chadwick Boseman, I thought, was good Mm -hmm. as T'Challa, even though he was just kind of mopey and dour throughout the movie. But it was a very kind of like... I mean, I I hate to say this because I don't want to give gravitas to a Marvel movie because I know that your head is going to explode, but it really had some kind of Shakespearean themes with like the king passing and the sun taking over. And I know, know, I'm sorry. what Marvel and Shakespeare in the in the same sentence? <laughs> I'm sleeping on the couch tonight. <laughs> okay, so what, what, what did fresh you... <laughs> hell have you wrought? Um, <laughs> what fresheth, fresheth Hades hath thine yes. brought? Um, <laughs> so what, I, what were your impressions? I really liked it. I uh, didn't like it as much as you did, um, but my characterization was very similar to yours. I thought it was pretty good. I it was a good, entertaining movie. I understand all the background and I understand why it's important. And I Mm -hmm. think those reasons that are important are, I completely agree with them and Mm -hmm. I buy into them. I think, in other words, having uh, an all African-American black cast, having a black director, having people writing in the, in the the people behind the scenes being African-American and being black. I think that that's all very important. Absolutely. Uh, I think that the story was, it was just kind of a, just another superhero story to me. It had a lot of mythical, as you said, Shakespearean, which I didn't think of, but it's perfectly <laughs> appropriate. It had a lot of good, cool background and this uh, kingdom that um, that they have. It's a it's this uh, fictitious country called Wakanda in yes. uh, Africa. They have um, this fantastic uh, super secret mineral that is called vibranium and it's uh got very many uh magical powers and it's uh it's essentially gold with many more uses right and so it's put this country in a really good position to be un- in control of their own destiny they haven't been colonized over the years as a result so therefore right. they've matured as a culture and as a country on their own it was really even though this is a work of fiction <laughs> it was really interesting to see how they were able to build such an egalitarian 
And I know, big word. Uh, adults, friends who drink when we say big words, that was for you. That, there's one right there. That's for you, <laughs> Scotty. <laughs> they built like this egalitarian, highly technologically advanced society because they didn't have white people coming in and raping the land right. and all of the... And enslaving the people. And enslaving the people and all the bad stuff besides that that comes about from colonization, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So it was really... So all that I right. appreciated. Like, the, And the characters didn't see themselves through the eyes of white people. Like they didn't right. defer to the white people. Like there was one right. white guy who was a CIA agent and they were like, you can't talk. Like they didn't... <laughs> Yeah. Defer to and, the white people automatically. But it also wasn't in your face. Like some movies in the past that have had largely African-American casts could be uh, perceived as being sort of aggressive in terms of pushing the culture out like Malcolm X or something like that in terms of mm-hmm. – because that's a story that it was, obviously. Right. But mm-hmm. some people – it might make white people uncomfortable in that instance. But this mm-hmm. – I didn't find that at all. I found this – I found it's like, yeah, why why shouldn't it be this way? Right. And, I mean, it's a superhero movie. Right. It's not... <laughs> it's not Malcolm X. If people are going to get their panties in a bunch over, like, an <laughs> all-black cast in a superhero movie, then they got bigger problems. Than, right. But it, it did strike me. I don't know at what point during the movie, but it did hit me, like, this is probably the first movie I've ever seen that is not geared, like mainly toward like urban audiences Mm -hmm. that has a majority black cast right like most of the black cast that you see are in the Medea movies or like barbershop or something like that which aren't necessarily intended to appeal to everybody like they have their demographic and that's what they're going for and if other people go see it great but this was this is a big tent marvel superhero movie and it was just the the main villain was a white guy and the CIA guy was white and that was pretty much yeah. pretty much it. Yeah. And I really enjoyed also how um the warrior guard ladies who guard the king, they're ladies. Yeah. They're all women. Like yeah. you don't have They were a kick butt. <laughs> they they were. They were there was a very there was a lot of empowerment in this movie. Yeah. Because totally. the women, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. they're the they're the elite fighting force. Right. They are empowered. They make mm-hmm. their own decisions. They stand up for themselves. Right. They're they, spies. They're going out in the world and doing spy stuff. They're in, independent <laughs> and right. they're then they're uh making decisions on their own. Like mm-hmm. what a concept. But right. that that's and in addition to the empowerment, obviously, of mm-hmm. the, the African-American narrative. I mean, I have no idea what I'm talking about because I'm white. Right. But from well, my perspective, it seemed like it was very well done and it was very – the empowerment was there. But also, I I looked at it as a superhero movie. Right. I didn't come into it saying, oh, this is a very big moment for uh-huh. black culture because right. that's not the culture I'm part of. But I was appreciative of that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, as a piece of art, as a piece of – significant uh, component to the culture. Mm-hmm. I thought it was good. I thought it was I thought it was I thought it was a just it was a very good movie. It wasn't excellent. It didn't blow me away. Mm-hmm. A lot of good special effects, a lot of good fight scenes, right. a lot of good blurred action like you usually see in the superhero movies like dark things, you know, dark background <laughs> and dark mm-hmm. uh, setting that you can't really see what's going on and and a lot of the same sort of things you see in other superhero movies. Right. It was it was well done. I liked Anthony uh, Circus as Claw. I thought he was fantastic. <laughs> he was a very hateable guy. Oh, yeah. Totally. And uh, like you said, uh, Michael B. Jordan as Eric Killmonger. I thought he was fantastic. He was also a very hateable guy. I, we, I vaguely looked this up. I couldn't really find any information on it. I really hope that Marvel signed both Michael B. Jordan and Sterling K. Brown, who played, uh, spoiler alert, Killmonger's father and T'Challa's father's brother, so <laughs> T'Challa's uncle. Yeah, uh, I really hope Marvel got those two under multi-picture contracts because they're both good actors, anyways. And then Killmonger, a lot of people have said, is a more interesting, compelling character than T'Challa, at least in this movie. Mm-hmm. So I would really hate it if because their characters maybe didn't necessarily survive to the end of the movie (laughs) that (laughs) that I would love it if they came back because they're both such good actors that I want to see more of them Mm -hmm. 
And tell people where we we've, we've seen Sterling K. Brown. Before. He he played uh, Chris Darden in The People versus O.J. Simpson. And was fantastic. fantastic. Yes. He was oh fantastic. my God. Yeah. So I didn't know who the fantastic. heck he was <laughs> before that, and because everybody was talking about the lady who played Marsha Clark and Courtney B. Vance who played Johnny Cochran, mm-hmm. and he was so good in that. Like he deserved all the awards he won. Yeah. Like I thought he was maybe him and Marsha Clark. Whoever played her were the best two mm-hmm. out of all the strong performances in that series. So I will I will watch that guy in anything um, except for This Is Us because we don't watch network TV. <laughs> so so I really hope Michael B. Jordan and Sterling K. Brown come back. And I think it's also worth noting Ryan Coogler, who directed Black Panther. This is his third movie that he's directed. The other two, also both with Michael B. Jordan, right? Creed and Fruitvale Station. Two great movies. Two Fantastic. That's the word of this podcast. Fantastic <laughs> movies. I mean, this guy, he's batting a thousand. Yeah. Black Panther, Fruitvale Station, and Creed, all great movies. He knows how to get a performance out of Michael B. Jordan. So, Well, and if you haven't seen Fruitvale Station, uh, it's another – it might have gone under the radar a little bit, um, but it was a fantastic movie. We saw that recently. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking movie. A story of a young uh, African-American in uh, San Jose. San, yeah, yeah, the Bay Area. The Bay Area. Yeah. And uh, just a really compelling story about an everyday guy and tragic circumstances. And it was uh, it was a nice little window into that into that uh, way of life. And it was it was really good. I, I, I thought it was really well directed and uh, suspenseful. And Michael B. Jordan was very subtle in that when he was mm-hmm. he was a little bit more um, as a regular guy, whereas in Black Panther he's an outsized villain and he does mm-hmm. he plays that part really well. He's very yeah. he's a tortured guy in that mm-hmm. and you can tell. Um, Chadwick Boseman and you mentioned earlier who's who's Black Panther, he was kind of understated but you you tend to be in these kinds of movies unless it's Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> in Iron Man. That was actually something that we said as soon as the movie was over and we, we did our immediate hot take, you know, rapid reactions. Like, so much of the, like, maybe the first third of the movie is just expository dialogue. And that really, for me, kind of weighed the first part of the movie down. Yeah, it was a boggy but, beginning, yeah. This is the introduction of a new character, basically, into the Marvel Universe. Because we've only seen Black Panther before, I believe, in Captain America's Civil War, Mm -hmm. which was two years ago. This is the first standalone movie he's had. So I see why you need so much background to introduce the character and Wakanda. People meeting Superman for the first time is like, well, here's what happened. He's from Krypton, and and he's Clark Kent, and all that sort of stuff. And... As you just said also, there are really no flashy Marvel superheroes except for Iron Man. Like, Thor's not really especially flashy. Mm -hmm. Captain America is not really especially flashy. Like, they have the hammer and the shield, but they're they're not Iron Man. They're not running around, like chasing skirts and drinking and they don't have the suit and, you know. They're not Robert Downey Jr. Right, they're not Robert Downey Jr. So there's only so much Chadwick Boseman could do with... The weight of the world on his shoulders. I think that's just the typical Marvel hero, right? right. And they're usually very understated, and then when they get the costumes on, they're saving mm-hmm. the world. It's, it's, it's meant to be that way. There's meant to be a paradox, I think. Right, and I've seen Chadwick Boseman also in 42. He played Jackie Robinson. Oh, right. yeah. And in... Uh, he was good in that. The James Brown... Uh, movie, yeah. yeah, I think it was called Get On Up, and he was the best part of that movie. It was what kind was he of in that? he was James Brown. He was James Brown. He uh, he's he's made a career out of playing like famous black people, wow. <laughs> really. And he, I mean, he wore that purple spandex jumpsuit, <laughs> like you know, it was nobody's business. And I, he was the best part of that movie. That movie was kind of a mess, but yeah, yeah, he was really good. So I think yeah. he's. Uh, I don't want to say he's underrated because he's been on the radar for a while, but mm-hmm. I hope. He's finally getting more recognition because he's been in this movie. Right. And well, you know going, there's going to be more, right? Yeah, and there's going to be more. Like, I'm sure he's got probably a six-picture deal with Marvel. And he's definitely going to be in The Avengers Infinity War, which is coming out in May. I know he's going to be in at least another couple Black Panther movies, probably another Avengers movie. So, Well, he's set because he's the yeah. guy now. He's Black yeah. Panther. So with the incredible opening weekend that it had, it opened, oh on, uh, opened on President's Day. It made crazy money. Yeah, and it's apparently one of the biggest of all time uh, openings, and I'm going to continue talking until I find it. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I would also like to, while Daltz is doing some research, uh, give a shout out to the soundtrack. 
uh, basically all Kendrick Lamar. I I enjoyed it. I thought it was... Which was number one on the Billboard Top 200 All right, over so the weekend. Black Panther just raking in the dough for Disney this weekend. Yeah, like, it was a good weekend for Black Panther. Yeah. So uh, according to CNN, money.cnn.com, Black Panther crushes box office records in opening weekend. Uh, it brought in $40.16 million on President's Day alone. And then uh, with the four-day weekend, the total was $241.9 million, And that's just in the U.S. Um, so that was an incredible, or so I, sh- I should say North America, not the U.S. Um, and th- so that was an incredible haul. I thought I read that worldwide it made something like $430 million, You're very like good, so far, Coco, so. with your memory. The film has now raked in $426.6 million <laughs> All globally <right. laughs> since opening international markets last Tuesday. Wow. The total does not include China, the second biggest movie market in the world, which it opens there on March 9th. Oh, so it could top the billion dollar mark when so, all is said and done. So the the film, as of this recording, mm-hmm. well, as of the uh, the news, uh, had been out for four days and had already made four hundred and twenty six million dollars. Yeah, and uh, I've been reading about how like people are dressing up. To go to the theater in... What they call that? Cosplay? Yeah. Cosplay? Like, yeah. So, uh, I mean, people people are super into it. Like, everybody on my Facebook feed, which I realize is... An echo chamber? Yeah. You know, not this huge random sample that would be representative, but people freaking love it. So, I'm sure people will see it repeatedly yeah. in the theater because that's the kind of movie that you need to see in the theater. So. Well, also, I think it will also stand up to... <laughs> Repeated viewings too, because yeah. it's a very complex movie. Mm-hmm. It's not just a. It's not just the first Superman where right. Christopher Reeve uh, has the red panties on. Rest in peace, uh, <laughs> yeah. great actor, and also know his son a little bit from ESPN days. Oh. Really good, really good guy. Oh, yeah. um, name drop, name drop. Uh, <laughs> it was a very simple movie. It was just him right. being a superhero. Right. This Black Panther is not this, and some of the Marvel movies, uh, the solo acts have been that in terms uh-huh. of the not the Avengers or the Guardians of the Galaxy, but the just the solo pieces have been very simple movies. Right. This is not a very simple movie. The obviously. first uh, Thor movie, even though it did introduce Loki into the Marvel Universe, and he's been a very important character for like all the Avengers movies and everything, um, that was just a cute little funny movie. Like, I, I loved the first Thor movie, and I know that Marvel fanboys are probably screaming and throwing their iPods or whatever across the room right now, but it was funny. Our it drunken was drunken Swedish fans. <laughs> right. Thor, our single drunken Swedish listener, is now <laughs> that's a theme, yeah, yeah. throwing his Nokia or, Tor, or as they Tor, say. that's right, I'm sorry. That part of the world. But yeah, it was funny, it was lighthearted, it was just a cute little uplifting movie directed by Kenneth Branagh like who would have thought so so I I loved that movie I thought it was awesome and that's one of my favorite Marvel movies actually and I hang my head in shame when I say that but it is so this is not Thor at all this is this is a different spectrum and going back to what you said about like you're white and that's not your culture like when I watched the people versus OJ Simpson when I watched it the second time with you I feel like I picked up on more of the racial themes and nuances on the second viewing like obviously the whole oj trial is about race like race is such a huge thing yeah but because i'm white and i don't have the lived experience of a minority in this culture in this country i felt like the second viewing of that i picked up on so many more of the nuances so that might be a thing too Mm -hmm. for us if we watch black panther again there might be nuances that we missed the first time you're just trying to get me back to the theater again for that, right? <laughs> no, I swear. We can wait till it's on Netflix. I promise. Like, I don't have to go back and watch Black Panther again. Like, I would go see that again if I if it was a double bill day, you know? Oh, like, yeah. if we went to see something and then surreptitiously went to another theater and Black Panther was playing. Which we never do. Which we would oh, never do, but yeah. if we happen to do that. <laughs> um, you mentioned something earlier about Black Panther. The one thing that I thought was missing was humor. Now, maybe that would have been inappropriate given the heavy message, mm-hmm. yeah. but some of the other Marvel movies are, are sure to have a lighter touch, especially right. the Iron Man movies, right. um, just because of the nature of, of Tony Stark slash uh, Robert Downey Jr., um, there weren't a lot of light movies in that movie, in, or light no, moments in that movie. Definitely not. Um, but it, that didn't—that wasn't an impediment towards me enjoying it. I just, I just, again, I thought it was a very typical superhero movie, 
that had subtext introduced mm-hmm. to it uh, and on various levels. And I actually appreciated they didn't try to force the humor in it. Like we said when we talked about The Last Jedi, a lot of the moments that right. in The Last Jedi were supposed to be funny, to me, felt really forced. Yeah. And I didn't really feel... The beginning was a little flat. Right. That, that, that weird, holding, I'm still holding, I'm right. waiting for, you know, whoever. And I so. thought maybe it was like Spaceballs by mistake, right? <laughs> right, We totally. were in the wrong theater. <laughs> yeah, Dark Helmet's going to show up, so... <laughs> and then Rick Moranis all of a sudden. <laughs> right, totally. So, I... Now that you mentioned it, I do appreciate that they didn't try to shoehorn in yeah. some kind of slapstick. Like, there were funny moments with them telling the white guy, like, now is not your time to talk. Right. But it wasn't, like I said, shoehorned in, like, some scene you could tell was added later to try to keep it from being quite so heavy. So and, heavy, yeah. And clearly the lack of humor didn't affect the box office. No. So. no. And, maybe, and that's just something that I look for because I look for something more than just heroics in my superhero movie i like the wisecracking you know arnold schwarzenegger from the 80s where he was so bad that he would crack these jokes and it would just be it would break the tension of how bad the acting was right, totally. the other thing i liked about black panther uh, and this is going to be a good segue for our next segment okay is uh, it was populated by probably the best looking cast that i have seen in a oh. long long time oh yeah. everybody in this mm. movie is very attractive and very yes. fit and uh-huh. and uh, very active. Oh yeah, and uh, that was something that maybe that's true in some of the other Marvel movies. I just really didn't notice it, but mm. it was a very very good looking cast. Well, not to I I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Should we just segue out of this segment now? <laughs> well, were we going to talk about the preview for another oh. <laughs> Marvel movie? Now yes. that we've spent so much time talking about like black empowerment yes. and stuff, let's do and that. So there was a preview for. There's another Marvel movie coming out this year, Ant Man and the Wasp. I believe it's coming out in July. I could be wrong about that. Ant Man is Paul Rudd. Uh, the Wasp is Evangeline Lilly from uh, Lost. I believe, uh, the old TV show on ABC. What's a TV show? What's ABC? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we just kind of thought it was funny that in a preview for a, for a movie, in a movie about black empowerment with an all-black cast, had a preview for a movie with Wasp. I, I, can, I can imagine. I can imagine somebody, an African American, is like, "Yeah, let's go, Black Panther," and they're sitting there and they're going, "Oh yeah, you got to balance it out with Wasp, don't with you? The wasp, you yes. got to have your super superhero <laughs> yeah. ahead of my superhero, right?" So, so, so we just thought that that was ironic, and and for those who don't know, Wasp is white Anglo-Saxon person. Oh, I thought it was Protestant. I thought that's what the piece oh, for. Yes, you're right. But you're right. I mean. White Anglo-Saxon person still works. I mean, <laughs> regardless. You. So, but I uh, I told adults that we do not have to go see Ant Man and the Wasp in theaters. We're we're definitely going to go see Infinity War in the theaters, but not. I, I like uh, Paul Rudd, but I do like Paul Rudd. I don't know, but Ant Man just doesn't turn me on. I think so. the most interesting part of that story, that movie, would be where does Stan Lee show up? Right. <laughs> Because he's always in the Marvel movies, and he was in Black Panther. He showed up in Black Panther at the casino. Yeah, he? yeah, he yeah. Uh, stole some movie, some money from T'Challa. Like T'Challa right. won like at the craps table or something. And he bailed, and then <laughs> Stanley stepped right in. So yeah. I'll just take that. Yeah. Stanley's the man. He's Stan the man. Stan is just going to be buried with a huge pile of cash. Stan is awesome. Yeah, I'm a Marvel fan from way back. Um, so anyway, the segue that I was introducing earlier about good-looking people. Which I apologize profusely for ruining your segue. No, you didn't at all. Um, we are going to segue to the uh, Letterman, uh, the next episode of Letterman, which... Uh, Letterman hot. Yes, David Letterman, who is the man uh, <laughs> with the soggy bottom uh, beard as... <laughs> George Clooney. As his next <laughs> guest was George Clooney. So yeah. one of the better-looking uh, male performers in this uh, acting world uh, he, was the guest of the second show. He is a very classically handsome man. He's got classical leading man good looks. He does. And uh, looking at some of the older photos they showed on that show, <laughs> he sort of grew into his looks a little bit. Yeah, he didn't he totally, always have them. I remember him from when he was Booker on Roseanne. Because unlike you, I love Roseanne. <laughs> and he uh, did not have his ER looks on Roseanne. He still had like the 80s mullet. In Roseanne. So he was talking about on the story, or on the uh, the show is my next guest, 
needs no introduction with David Letterman. And that was, uh, George Clooney was the second guest that he's had now. And that was uh, debuted last week, I believe. Um, and on one of the segments that they showed, George Clooney was going over some of the shows that he'd been on before he made <laughs> it to ER. And he was on this show that, uh, the name escapes me now, but he was a uh, detective during the day and a rock star at night or something like that. <laughs> we need to see if that's on Netflix or something. Because he said it was only seven or eight episodes, and I really want to see it now. Because he said... During the rock star portion of the show, he'd be on stage playing his bass and then be like, go arrest that guy, like off in the wing. So that, it, I'm sure it's a lot funnier the way he delivered it. But And it he, was, had, uh, he had uh, the rock star haircut. He yeah. had the, uh, it wasn't a mullet, but it was it was threatening a mullet. It was kind of feral-like how feathered it was. It was kind of feral-like, you're yeah. right. And with the dark eyebrows, and he didn't. it was all black, so he didn't mm-hmm. have the dignified salt and pepper like he's got now. And right. short. So anyway, what did we think of the second episode of The Letterman Show? Well, I, I gave my opinion on Black Panther first, so do you want to go first on this one? All right. So Unless that messed you up, and then I can totally go first. No, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Okay. I, I, I prepared. I, the crack research staff <laughs> is giving me a stack of papers here. <laughs> That uh, I am totally going to read verbatim from. Um, I thought that the second episode was not very good. Uh, sorry, Dave. I, I love David Letterman. I'm really I really want to like this series. Definitely. The first one with uh, Barack Obama, former president of the United States. Obviously, um, I thought it was good, but it was more the chemistry of these two guys together. The same thing with Clooney. They seem to know each other mm-hmm. pretty good, or they pretend to. Who knows in Hollywood if they really know each other or if right. they just uh, pretend to know each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you mentioned it, and I don't want to take away what you were going to say, but uh, but I will anyway. Um, I didn't learn a lot about right. George Clooney, and mm-hmm. I learned a little bit about David Letterman. Um, but I didn't really – it didn't really dazzle me. However, I like both of these guys so much mm-hmm. that I was still – interested in in this episode i still followed it along it wasn't like i was going to turn it off in the middle i was like oh this is outrageous right it was still an you know a fun easy interesting conversation yeah. between the two of them to watch yeah. but i'm um, like you i don't even though i don't i didn't feel after the obama episode that i know everything about obama now i really learned so much about his childhood or whatever but i did learn a little bit about him mm-hmm. and like you said the interplay between the two of them was like very easy yep. and you know it was so good but with Clooney and Letterman like I really enjoyed that story he told about driving his aunt Rosemary around in Vegas when she was <laughs> right. old and he was her driver but otherwise like he didn't really talk about his kids which okay I understand your kids are his very twins. small yep. and you don't necessarily want to put them out there for public consumption you want them to be private but he didn't i feel like letterman talked more about his kid yep. than clooney talked about his like or clooney even just being a dad right like he didn't talk about how his life has changed since he became a father he i sort of got the sense too that he wasn't really an enthusiastic father right yeah well we can we can talk about my theories or whatever about him and his personal life in a bit but yeah i just (laughs) or do we want to go there i don't know if we want to go there but i just i yeah i didn't feel like i learned anything about him i the editing at the end was choppy yeah it was choppily done yeah and the segments so once again letterman left the studio for pre-taped segments with uh this time clooney's family in kentucky and those segments felt really forced like they introduced the Iranian, I believe, refugee that the Clooney family was sponsoring here in the States. And that felt really forced. And suddenly we're in a car and the Iranian is driving. And, you know, like... It was a Prius, it, though. Oh, oh, that's right. It was a Prius. Yeah, so, it was a Prius. All right. You know, fist bump. But it just... <laughs> I, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't love it. So I, I think what's going on here is that David Letterman's trying to be perhaps a journalist or have a journalistic type magazine show Mm -hmm. and that's just not in his wheelhouse his wheelhouse is more the late night talk show kind of 15 minutes of talking to a guy and moving on you know what do you got coming on and uh, you know what's your big what are you pushing right now and let's talk about it right i think with obama he was more engaging because i think he he was more forthcoming about what he was talking about. Uh-huh. He was more introspective about life outside the office and that sort of thing. It wasn't there right. wasn't much that Letterman was asking that got him there. I think Obama was used to directing a conversation. And Obama's not in office anymore, so he doesn't so he necessarily care. have to be guarded right. about anything right. he says. And how many interviews has he done since he's been out of office? Right. Right. So that was an opportunity for him to to show to talk about uh-huh. what his life is like. 
Clooney, I don't think, really had as much to offer in that way. He's not really mm-hmm. pushing anything right now. Yeah. He just kind of was on the show as a favor to David Letterman. So therefore, yeah. he wasn't... I mean, there were some some interesting things that I had I didn't know about his background in terms of his dad yeah. and how involved his dad was and, and the fact that his dad was a journalist. Mm-hmm. Um, I might have read that at some point in a, in a Vanity Fair or an Esquire profile and forgot about it. But... Mm-hmm. Um, Overall, I didn't think it was it was very compelling, and and the just like you said, I wasn't crazy about the segment in Kentucky. It just it just felt like it was not. There was one at one point, Letterman made some sort of glib comment to the Iranian uh, refugee, and it was very awkward because the Iranian is is talking about his friends dying and yeah. and and the horrible you know situation of ISIS mm-hmm. uh raiding his town and everything like that and it just felt jarring to me it didn't feel like it was somebody should have edited that out i think yeah and i i get what he's trying to do there because in the obama episode they went down to selma and they talked about the march in selma with congressman right. john lewis who was there and now he's in congress and he's a civil rights hero so i understand trying to bring more to the table than just another celebrity interview, which right. Letterman has done thousands of in the 30, 35 years he was a late night talk show host. But yeah, I, I just, I it don't. feels like padding at this point. It feels yeah. like because he's used to the 10 or 15 minute bursts with these high profile first guests on mm-hmm. his show, which is, this is the equivalent to, yeah. it feels like these little segments are padding to make the show longer. Mm-hmm. And I think that he's a smart enough guy, Letterman, that he could he could hold his own on a forty five minute long profile interview right. uh-huh. and talk to this guy and go back and forth rather than just like, "Hey, I think you're great." Right, and they even actually at the opening of the show and then the very end of the show were Letterman and Clooney standing outside an In and Out Burger in L.A. Right. like watching the planes from LAX fly over and. So there's more padding right there, too. Like, yeah. what, why do they need the In-N-Out kid to come over with chocolate milkshakes right. and be all like, here's your shakes on the house, sirs? You know, And like, we didn't really get anything out of that segment, either. It no. wasn't like, oh, like, we, we understood that David Letterman was calling the planes as they were landing. He's <laughs> right. like, oh, there's a 787 and right. there's a 777. You know, right. and he was a big fan of planes, and so we got that out of it. But George Clooney was just essentially stuffing his maw full of... <laughs> French fries and, and burgers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which, I mean, I'd, you know, if Letterman wanted to crack jokes at me while I ate fries, I, I'd do it, but I don't, nobody wants to watch that. <laughs> well, I would watch it. I would pay to watch that. You would not. I would. You have if to, it was you. You have to say that. Well, maybe, but this I'd is, still do it. This is why we have a successful relationship, people. <laughs> I publicly declare my, my reliance upon you. <laughs> so, should we move to the next segment? Oh, sure. Let's go to the next segment. I know that this is something that Coco has been preparing for for weeks to talk about this. <laughs> and as a matter of is... fact, this is one of the reasons that we've been delayed in taping the next <laughs> podcast because I had to really calm her down. <laughs> right. This is why it's taken until February the 20th to tape a podcast in February <laughs> because I've been, you know, researching this so thoroughly. So so I'm going to say three words. Okay. This will be, this will be word association, oh, actually okay. name association. Okay. And then you react to it as you see fit. Okay. Okay, ready? Yeah. Sarah Jessica Parker. Mean girl. Oh, and yeah. why? <laughs> okay, so we're going to require a little bit of a deep dive. So here. we're going to do some Black Panther-esque background. Right. Heavy on the expository dialogue okay. coming up. Okay. Um, so as most, if not all of you are aware, Sarah Jessica Parker was the star of Sex and the City, the TV show which ran for... I believe six years on HBO from 98 to around 2004. Two movies followed, both crap. Um, (laughs) Let's just put that right out there. Uh, Literally nobody in the world wanted a third movie to be made. Literally? I know Daltz's head explodes when I say literally, when I don't mean literally. But literally nobody in the world wanted a third Sex and the City movie to be made. For some reason... Some of us didn't want a first Sex and the City movie made. <laughs> I, I don't think they should have made either one of the movies either. Really? I, I didn't like the first one. I know most people did. I didn't. Uh, but that is neither here nor there. So some for some reason back in September, and I'm going to try to be quick about this because I know a lot of people don't care about Sex and the City. Sarah Jessica Parker gave an... Or remember in, what it is. Or Yeah, right. <laughs> some people don't remember the 90s, which I don't because I'm only 29. So um, right. she gave an interview saying that Sex and the City 3 had been a go and they had a script made, but uh, unfortunately things fell apart. They couldn't get the cast lined up and 
Coincidentally, that same week, both the Daily Mail and I believe People ran stories anonymously sourced or sources close to Sarah Jessica Parker saying the movie fell apart because Kim Cattrall is a demanding diva. Kim Cattrall, who played Samantha Jones, the uh, cougar sex pot on the original series. Canadian. Canadian. There we go. She wanted too much money. She was making all these demands and everybody else was tired of waiting on her. So everything fell apart. Kim Cattrall responds and says, uh, yeah, that's not what happened. I just, I'm 60 years old. I don't want to play this part anymore. I don't want to get naked on screen anymore. I'm done. I don't feel like this character has any more legs, so to speak. So that was a good time in my life. I'm sorry it's over, but I'm done. Whatever. Sarah Jessica Parker could not let it go. It dragged out for months. Like, sources went to the tabloids and the Daily Mail and complained more and more about Kim Cattrall. Uh, Andy Cohen from Bravo, who is a Sarah Jessica Parker friend. A couple of the characters on Sex and the City, those actors came out and basically were SJP's minions and said this is all Kim's fault. Even though it should be noted... Chris Noth, who played Mr. Big, said that he had never been contacted about a third movie. So either this movie was nowhere near the production stage or they were going to kill him off. Or he wasn't in it, yeah. Yeah. So things finally came to a head a couple weeks ago when Kim Cattrall's brother went missing and then he was found dead. And Sarah Jessica Parker, she did make a statement. She was at some kind of gala. She made a statement to like... Entertainment Tonight or something saying, you know, poor Kim, my condolences to her and her family. But then she had to take it one step beyond and she wrote on Kim Cattrall's Instagram some kind of really over the top, my dearest Kim, Godspeed to your brother. I can read it right now. Okay, yeah. Dearest Kim, my love and condolences to you and yours and Godspeed to your beloved brother, XX. And Kim Cattrall was having none of that. She finally snapped and wrote back on her Instagram and said, oh, you can say it. Right. Well, I okay. got it. Stop exploiting our tragedy in order to restore your nice girl persona. Like, uh, I don't need your lover support at this tragic time. So everybody grieves differently. I know Kim Cattrall got a lot of flack for writing that kind of vitriolic response on her Instagram. Ooh, vitriolic. Take a Ooh, shot. There's another one, Scotty. <laughs> yeah, take a shot. <laughs> I mean, I I don't blame her. Like, she's been getting ripped well, in the press for six months by unnamed sources close to SJP. She didn't start this fight, right? Yeah, I she mean... did not start this. And now her brother has just been found dead. And SJP is using this literally to... Literally? Literally to restore the nice girl... But persona, but it seems and, so opportunist. Is that you're going at this person from all angles, and mm-hmm. they have tragedy in their life, and right. so you're being the sincerity of your attacks uh, is probably true. It's probably exactly. like she's she's got a serious hate on for Kim Cattrall, right? And then all of a sudden you're doing a, a, a 180, and you want to show uh, compassion. And I right. understand that, but the uh-huh. best way to do that is probably to not do anything at all. And just back off and give somebody their space. Like, I think the first statement she made to Entertainment Tonight or whoever it was, just a very generic, I'm very sorry to hear this, my condolences to her and her family. Like, I think that would probably have been okay. That's good enough. If she had stopped there. But then to write the saccharine, over-the-top message on the Instagram, like, Kim Cattrall doesn't need to deal with this. Right. Like, her brother has just been found dead. This is a tragedy. And to compound the tragedy... (laughs) Right after all this goes down on Instagram, the very next week, both People and Us Weekly have covers featuring Sarah Jessica Parker. Right. Once again, bashing Kim Cattrall, talking about what kind of diva she is, how unmanageable she is. Has this woman even buried her brother? And now she's got to deal with tabloids. Who are clearly like the people tab the people cover was an actual interview with Sarah Jessica Parker. It wasn't unnamed sources. It was SJP saying without what SJP literally was quoted as saying was just, I'm not responding to her. I never started this. You know, it's her privilege to say whatever she wants. 
Which is BS, because all she's been doing for the past six months in the press is running to the Daily Mail and saying... Stoking the fire. You know, a source close to SJP says this. So, oh my God. Like, <laughs> SJP, STFU. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Strong. Yeah, that's... I'm going there. Cause that's strong. This... I don't know what that stands for, and I don't want to know, but... Shut the freak up. <laughs> <laughs> So what our listeners might not know about me is that I spent 18 months as a celebrity gossip blogger. As a celebrity? As a celebrity oh. gossip blogger, yes. So, yes. And one of the hard and fast rules of celebrity gossip blogging is when somebody tries really hard to convince you of one thing, the opposite is actually true. Yeah. So people coming out and being like, we're not getting divorced. And then a month later, they're getting divorced. Right. So all this proves to me is that it's actually... Sarah Jessica Parker, who's the problem in this relationship, <laughs> because she's the one who's trying so hard to be like, I don't have a problem with Kim at all. And meanwhile... Tearing into her. Yeah, tearing into her, even though it's anonymously sourced stories. Like, some tabloids make stuff up, but not everybody does. So so I'm wondering, my contribution to this debate will be... <laughs> because talk- you love Sex in the City so much. Because I love Sex in the City so much. I'm not really a huge Sarah Jessica Parker fan. Mm-hmm. I've never really been. Um uh, but I do like the show that she's in with Thomas Hayden Church on HBO, which is Divorce. Mm-hmm. Uh, no reason that I like the the subject or the show or anything <laughs> like that. Not not that I've ever been through a divorce. But um, the first season was really good. Mm-hmm. It was uh, touching. And I, I'm a big fan of Thomas Hayden Church. And he was great in uh, a lot of things that I've seen him in. Uh, better known as the guy in Wings, probably. Best yeah. known. Um However, uh, the second season has not been very good, and it's actually been not well-received critically. So I'm wondering if that's putting a little bit of pressure on Sarah Jessica Parker. And she's also uh, an executive producer as part of this divorce show. So, And that's the thing I wonder also is that she's supposed to be on the promotional trail talking up divorce. Right. And instead, she's, in she's still talking about Sex in the City, <laughs> right. which ended... 14 years ago, the series, even though it's still an HBO property, so they're probably happy to yeah. have that kind of backwards promotional push. Like, <laughs> But they still have a show that's on right now that's not doing very well, mm-hmm. and their star can't be bothered to promote it because she's too busy grinding an axe against a co-star. Yeah. So. Well, and it's interesting, Sex and the City was very much uh, a pioneering show in its time, right? It was Mm -hmm. four women doing their own thing and not answering to men and and turning the tables on men in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So you would think that show now would be more relevant, or a movie Mm -hmm. would be more relevant and more appealing than ever before. Um, But it just doesn't seem like it's... It seems like that ship has sailed. Maybe you get a reboot, reboot, like, like they did with Ghostbusters or they've done with any number of shows, is that... Get four new women, younger, right. and put them in, maybe not New York this time, but put them in San, London. Yeah, or, or San Francisco. Or San or, Francisco yeah. or Seattle or something like that. Right, totally. I could see that coming back. But like you said, the ship has sailed on the original. The movies were awful. The last couple seasons of the TV show shouldn't have happened. It probably should have ended before it did, which you can say about most shows. So that's not right. unique to Sex in the City. But like I said... Literally nobody Literally. wanted this movie to be made. I haven't seen anything once again on my Facebook feed, you know, which is not a representative sample, but nobody ever posted like, man, I just caught a Sex in the City marathon on E! this weekend. and Sure miss that show. I sure miss that. I wish they'd bring back a third movie. Nobody wants this movie. It's done. <laughs> Let it go. Like, I don't know if SJP has money trouble or something, if that's why she really wants this movie to get made, because she knows she's going to get paid like Marky Mark for it, but (laughs) we're going back to Marky Mark. Marky Mark. Wouldn't be a podcast without a Marky Mark reference. Everybody else is getting union scale, and SJP is just rolling around in a bathtub full of money, but... I think Marky Mark is is, and his goons are chasing us down (laughs) (laughs) for the many references we've... Not complimentary references we've had of Marky Mark. So that's, I I had to talk about that because this is just remarkable that this has dragged on for almost six months now. It's been five solid months of just Sarah Jessica Parker in the press, just nonstop hammering at Kim Cattrall and poor Kim Cattrall. And like I said, has she even buried her brother? And now she's on the cover of two tabloids, like being dragged for not wanting to make a movie. I mean, that's what this boils down to. She doesn't want to make a movie and she's getting 
just ripped to shreds. Just because she doesn't want to make a movie. Right. So what's the over-under <laughs> on Kim Cattrall doing this movie? Oh, I'm, I'm taking the under. This, Which means she's not going to do it. She's not doing it. Yeah. Like, this movie is... And There's no way she's going to do that now. No, definitely not. Like, she's, she's Why done. Why would she? She wasn't going to make it before. She's just she's twice as much not going to make it now. Right. Yeah, there's there's no way she's coming. And that was apparently, that's a big rumor about the studio only said they'd do it with all four lead actresses. Right. So Because right. Kim Cattrall said back when this first broke six months ago, hey, recast the part. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Kill her off. I'm cool with that. Yeah, like she, she had cancer, she could get a recurrence of cancer. The character, yeah, right. But well, so what they should do is that they must have like daughters or offspring. <laughs> so just get them to spin, or even maybe the offspring have offspring, right? <laughs> that are age appropriate, <laughs> yeah. And they make it Sex in the City uh, third generation and make it that, and then the older characters are just dropping in here and there. If yeah. they're 60 years old. They could be Rosemary Clooney's driver. It's not like Golden Girls <laughs> remake or something like that. I like it. I think that's a great idea. I think we should push that out. I think we should. Netflix. Here we come. So we're going to have to wrap up this episode. Episode 008 of Coco and Dalts. We don't have time for lounge songs that we want to hear. What? Uh, oh, we man. were going to do some lounge versions of Come On, Feel the Noise. Let's Get Physical. <laughs> Oh, really? I have the tiger. <laughs> Another one bites the dust. <laughs> I love rock and roll. Billie Jean and a lounge version of My Sharona. But we're not, we don't have time for that. So maybe next week. You actually made a whole list. I, I made a see, list. I can see it right here. And That's... on my computer, I've got the lyrics in front of me. So I could have done it. But Rolling down the length of my thigh, Sharona. There we go. <laughs> I still like the owl. Uh, Yankovic version of that, my Bologna. <laughs> but <laughs> Weird Al is awesome. Weird Al. <laughs> and so for another week, I'm not Coco. And I'm not Dolls. <laughs>